Good afternoon. Thank you so much for coming. I'm Marty. This is Laura. She's going to start us off today. Marty and I first saw this book, actually saw it printed, in the winter of 2016. And as we said earlier, it was the culmination of about three years of work documenting the coverlets in the Shiloh Museum collection. And what we did was a physical documentation, the measurements, the colors, the fibers, all of that, as well as learning the histories. And in some cases, we were able to do some research and add information to what the museum already knew about their pieces. And while our names are on the cover of the book, we have to give a lot of credit to other people who designed Liz Lester, um, Don House, a name many of you will know, took the, the most of the pictures that are in this book, and all the people here at Shiloh, whom I'm sure we annoyed at one time or another, asking questions and asking for information. So I want to give credit where credit is due. Here are a couple of coverlets from that book. And I want to point out just a couple things. The one on the left, obviously, is bright red. And we were told very early on that red coverlets are very rare. In fact, one expert said she'd only seen one in all of her years of looking at coverlets. Well, you know, she'd never been to Arkansas. <laughs> because we have found several. Um, this is one on the left. On the right, you see the dark blue, which is probably an indigo dye. That's very classic for this time period. On the left, this time, you see two shades of blue, so we're getting a little more adventurous. And on the right, you see a window pane design. And while this was not the only one we saw with this window pane design, it is not typical. So this one is unique and a nice coverlet. On the right, again, you see the indigo blue. But I especially want to point out the coverlet on the left. And I want to point out its perfect circles and they interlock. This pattern is called wig rose. It is woven by Martha Wilson, and that's all I'm going to tell you right now, but remember that for later. So along the way of working on, these, on this research, we kept hearing little tidbits about, well, there's a coverlet at the Salem Springs Museum, or Rogers has a few coverlets, and so the idea began to develop that we would go forward with this project, not stop with the collection here at Shiloh, but go forward and document other coverlets in other institutions. And that's what we have chosen to do. And we're going to talk about all that. But first, for those of you who are not weavers, I w uh, Marty's going to tell you what makes a coverlet. What, what does a coverlet do? Or how, does, how is it made? Okay, so no quiz. I'll be easy on you and just tell you. A coverlet is a hand-woven bedspread. It's that easy. Now, there are things that are hand-woven that are put on beds that aren't coverlets. You can weave a blanket, a little different. But a coverlet is a specific kind of bed covering that's hand-woven, and, and they look like this. They have these wonderful geometric patterns. Not to be confused with, and lots of times people say, oh, you talk about quilts, you love quilts. We do love quilts. We don't talk about them, we don't research them. You all know what quilts are, right? There's a front, there's a back, there's a batting, it's quilted together. So a quilter starts with material, cuts it in little pieces, and then sews it back together. And we love these, they're wonderful. But we don't research those. <laughs> we research coverlets. Weavers start with thread, and they make the material. That's the difference. We don't start with material and do something with it. We make the material itself. We make the material using looms. Here's a picture of a weaver. This is the kind of loom that they use. You can see they're huge, but they break down. You can stow them away in the rafters when you're not using them or somewhere in your house. But they're these large, very sophisticated but simple pieces of equipment that help us weave. So in order to make a coverlet, you have to have a loom. So that's one aspect of a coverlet. It's woven and it's put on the bed. This is also a coverlet, and we see these. We don't re research these too much because we don't specialize in them. The coverlets that we look at are woven by women or weavers in their homes for their families. These kind of coverlets are fantastic. 
What happened was coverlets were so popular during a certain period of time in American history that people built these fantastic mechanized looms called jacquard or jacquard looms that could weave flowers, trees, plants, animals, dates, buildings, names, anything. And they set up workshops and they would weave these for sale. So they set up businesses where they would weave these for sale to other people. The coverlets we look at are woven, as far as we know, for the most part, by women in their homes for their own families. So there's a difference there. So we love these, we see them, but that's not the focus of our research. The most common question we get is, how long does it take to make a coverlet? And uh, Laura has a cute saying, well, you start with some cotton seeds and you start with a sheet. <laughs> because coverlets are made out of cotton and wool. And all the ones that you're gonna see, the creamy or the white part is cotton thread, and the colored is going to be wool. So the uh, weavers started out with this thread that oftentimes we believe they made themselves. Here's a picture of the Hagerty family. They live in Cave Springs, and this is an Ozark textile production factory. They're demonstrating how cotton thread is made. So this happy woman here at the end, that's the, one of the Spencer daughters, she's picking the seeds, the sticky black seeds out of the cotton bowls. The next sister is carding the fiber to line the, the cotton um, fibers so that the mother can spin them on her walking wheel and give it to the daughter-in-law who spins it on a reel, puts it on a reel so then they can use it. We came across this really interesting piece of writing by a woman who was a spinner during this time. And she said that that reel, you would turn it 160 times to make what's called a cut. And so that reel will make two yards with one circular motion. So a cut 160 times would be how many yards? 320, right? You got that? Okay. So that a cut would be 320 yards. Four cuts equals a hand. That's what they called it. And a hand was enough yarn to do the weft for one yard of fabric. So they could measure out and kind of guess, okay, we've got about enough yarn for this. And it takes a while to make these. So most people didn't make 20 of these. We found a few people that might have made six or 10 maybe. Most women would just have made one, maybe two, because they're very labor intensive, they require a lot of skill, and they take a lot of time. So that's how they're made. Um, and when were they made? Well, these were very popular from the late 1700s up through the late 1800s. And again, this depends on the region of the country. One of those experts said, no coverlets were woven after the Civil War. Well, we know from our research that's incorrect. In this part of the country and probably in the Appalachians, they continued to be woven in the home for home use. Now, a little bit later, especially in the Appalachian Mountains, the coverlets uh, were being woven for sale. And that's kind of a different thing. That's not part of what we're studying right now. If you think about the time that these coverlets were popular, roughly 100 years, and if you think about the history that happened during that time period, these coverlets witnessed the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, which, by the way, textiles were very much a part of the, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. They've been through multiple wars and, of course, all the personal dramas that probably took place in the homes. If these coverlets could talk, what a tale they would tell. That's a song I heard on the radio the other day. So let's take a little tour of some of the museums that we have looked at and, and just maybe one or two coverlets from each one. This is Cane Hill in 1907. And Cane Hill was actually one of the earliest areas of settlement in what has become Washington County. So this photograph was taken uh, not quite a hundred years after the original settlement. It looks like a busy little town there and if you go over there right now you'll see what appears to be a sleepy village but if you haven't been I encourage you to go because they are doing some absolutely wonderful things with the preservation of these old structures and of the history which is very rich in the Cane Hill area. So pick a pretty fall day and go over there. There's some wonderful trails that you can walk. So there's Cane Hill in 1907. In their collection, they have two complete coverlets, full-size coverlets, 
and one that is a fragment. Now, if you stood in front of this piece hanging on the wall, I would excuse you if you said to me, what is that rag doing <laughs> hanging on the wall in a museum? Because quite honestly, that's what it looks like. And of course, all white textiles do not photograph well. And so I've done a little bit of a close up and I've also darkened it a little bit on this part of the photograph so you can see the pattern. So why is this the one of the three pieces that I chose to tell you about? Well, it, it has some interesting aspects to it. Marty just told you that the pattern weft is wool. In this case, the pattern weft, which is kind of these little blocks of color, right? not color, but blocks of, of shading, is cotton. This is from the McClellan family. The family story is that it was, the threads were spun and the coverlet was woven in Alabama while the family lived on a cotton plantation before they came to Cane Hill in 1830. So this rag is one of the earliest pieces that we've looked at, that we can put a pretty definite date on. And it is the only piece in all the things we've looked at so far that has a cotton pattern weft. So it's kind of a special rag. <laughs> e even, if, even if you look at it and you go, oh, yeah, okay, whatever. But it, it has some, some special characteristics. Next, we're going to look at Prairie Grove Battlefield State Park. That area is not too far from Cane Hill, and it was settled also very early in our region's history. Unfortunately, a lot of what's in the collection at Prairie Grove has no provenance connected to it. Things were just given to them over the years when the park was operated by volunteers and then later by the Lions Club, and so we don't know who made this particular coverlet. But it's interesting in the color choices and you see, again, the, the dark color and this sort of mauve color, which we see a lot in coverlets, and that probably was dyed with madder root, M-A-D-D-E-R root. And we see that a lot. This coverlet's pattern name is Original Governor's Garden, and that one shows up a lot. It's a popular pattern. And still at Prairie Grove, we have a red one. I, I, the, that expert who said she'd only seen one is no longer living, but I've always wanted to, to send her a letter and tell her there are lots of red ones. The, the interesting thing about this one is how big the repeat is. So as she's weaving, she can't see the whole thing. And I know from my own experience, if I can't see it, I probably made a mistake somewhere and I didn't catch it because I couldn't see the whole thing. But this is a very attractive coverlet and, and would be gorgeous on the bed. And next we go to the Washington County Historical Society. This particular coverlet and one other, uh, actually a couple others, are on display at Headquarters House, which is just off the square in Fayetteville. And again, if you haven't been to Headquarters House, I encourage you to go visit. It's an interesting place. Here we have another large repeat. You see this? These, these are big repeats, both uh, horizontally and vertically. Okay, now here is the trick, and I don't know if you'll be able to see this or not. Most of these coverlets are uh, at least two panels because the looms were not wide enough to weave the, weave the full width that they needed for the coverlet. So most of them are at least two panels, some of them three. This one is a two-panel one, and here is the seam. Look how perfectly that's matched. This is a sign of a very good weaver, and you think she's weaving on a, a loom which is probably a little wonky, her floor may not be level, something's loose, all those things go into it, and she's managing to get every one of her pattern repeats exactly the same size on both panels so that when she puts them together, the patterns will meet. I take my hat off to her because I don't always manage that the two panels. Mm -hmm. This one is sewn, and many of them, the panels are sort of butted together and sewn, or with a very narrow hem. This one has a very deep hem, and so I think she planned it that way 
so she'd have a little bit of leeway in putting it together. You know, that's, that's just me 100 years later making, making that up. But based on my experience as a weaver, I think she planned it that way. Now, in this particular case, we do know the weaver. And here she is. This is Charity Kimmons Garrett. She was born in Tennessee in 1815. She and her husband had six children before they came to Arkansas, and they moved to Mayfield, Arkansas, which is between Elkins and Goshen, which is east of the Fayetteville-Springdale area. And they came here in 1857, 1858, along in that time frame. Her granddaughters wrote this reminiscence. Polly's granddaughters remembered that Grandmother Garrett would take the wool, cart it, and weave it into uniforms for the Confederate soldiers. Another granddaughter remembered she would spin the wool late at night and early in the morning, and her children thought she never went to bed. So her time period is right in the middle of the coverlet weaving. But we have to remember that not only were they weaving coverlets, they were also weaving their sheets, their towels, any carpets, their table linens, everything. There was not a Walmart that they could go visit for those kinds of things. So the coverlets probably were done after they'd done all the, the really necessary stuff. Our next one is also an interesting one. Remember the perfect circles? Okay, here we have the same thing. This is wig rows again, and you see the front and the back. This one was, is woven in black. We believe dyed black, not from a black sheet. And that's based more on the, if you see the whole coverlet, you can see some shading uh, of the threads. And so we believe it was dyed black, but it is black wool dyed. And the weaver, we believe, and I just love saying this woman's name, Zulima Zalance Webb, and she married Thomas Frank Price. And she was also born in 1838 in Tennessee, and she came to the Pea Ridge area in 1852. She was 14 years old. And so if, as we believe, that she is the weaver, she would have woven this one in the Arkansas Ozarks. Many of the coverlets that we've looked at have been brought to this area, but we believe this one was woven here. And she must have been a fine weaver because, again, the circles are pretty pretty true, pretty round, and it's nicely done. And you'll see another piece of hers in a little bit. These two are at the Rogers Historical Museum, woven by the same woman. And I picked, the, the, it was hard for me to pick out the one from each institution that I wanted to show you. But this one on the left uh, is in excellent condition, and the color choices are really good. This one is three shades of green, as I recall, and it's just a very interesting color combination. I have to admit it's not my favorite color combination, but it's very attractive and nicely done. On the right, I wanted to show you this one to show you the condition of the coverlets. Not always, certainly, but often we find them very badly worn. All this area in here, you see where that is, that should be brown, that should be brown. There should be many color blocks of brown. And in this case, it's been used. The entire coverlet has been used and worn and, and loved. But also, we know that when wool is dyed brown, they have to use some very strong mordants or chemicals to set the brown dye, and that's hard on the thread. So lots of times brown is not in very good condition just because of the dye that's used. And here's a case, again, where we do know who wove this, and we believe this is our weaver right here, Lucy Sarah Dodson Christian McLeod. And I want to tell her story because this is very typical of the weavers that we've encountered. She was born in Tennessee. Do you see a pattern here? So many of the settlers in our area came from Tennessee. She was born in Tennessee in 1833. She married as a teenager, again, very typical. And she and her husband and, in fact, her parents and several others from the same region moved to Arkansas between the births of, of, births of her second and third children. And her third child died at the age of four. Again, we found that 
frequently among our weavers from this time period. Her husband was killed in the Civil War, and then she married a man who had served with him in the Civil War. And after the war, they moved, the whole family moved, to what we would now say is south of Rogers, except in 1866 when they moved, Rogers wasn't a town yet. Not until the, the railroad came in 1881. So I'm going to say south of Rogers, but Rogers wasn't there yet. Interestingly, the lumber for this house was brought from Lawrence County. Why they trucked lumber from Lawrence County to south of Rogers in 1866 to build the house, I don't know. This house is still standing, and I have been in it, and it doesn't have too many years left. We were careful where we set our feet when we walked around. But it was kind of cool to be in it and know that she had lived here, might have woven her coverlets here. We don't really know when she did her weaving, whether it was after she came to our part of Arkansas or not. Now, interestingly, after all this hardship that she's been through, she lived to be 82 years old, which I think is a testament, actually. I've decided in this time period, you either died young or you lived long, one or the other. Okay, remember the one I told you to remember, Martha Wilson, and here's her coverlet right here. And you see it in a box. This is how the coverlets are stored in this museum and in some of the others. This box is an acid-free box, and it has acid-free tissue in the folds to protect the coverlet itself. So that's how they're taken care of and conserved. And periodically, they're taken out, refolded, so the fold lines aren't the same. And that was our job as we went through this. We would take them out, document them, and then we would refold them in a different way so that they would go back in the boxes somewhat differently. Look at this coverlet, more circles, but these are not interlocking. This pattern is called lover's knot, and as it happens, lover's knot and wig rose are the same threading on the loom, but they are treadled differently. Okay, for you non-weavers, just nod your heads. <laughs> for you weavers, you'll pick up on that. Um, so she might have threaded her loom with a really, really, really long warp and woven this one and taken it off the loom and then changed what her feet were doing and woven this one. We don't know that. These, these may be two completely different time frames, but that's possible. All three were woven by Martha Wilson. How do we know that? Well, because Shiloh now has lots of information about coverlets. They often get phone calls I have a coverlet, can someone look at it? And of course, we show up. And uh, Martin Tuller brought these two in, and he said, I believe that my great-grandmother, and he gave a name, and I believe she wove these. And I instantly recognized the name, and it was Martha's daughter. But as we did the research, we came to the conclusion that it was Martha that had woven all three of these. So the one on the left and the right are still in private hands, owned by Martin and his sisters. But he did bring them. We got to look at them with this other one that we know Martha wove uh, all together. And so he learned a lot of things. He didn't know a lot about that particular branch of his family. And so not only are we getting to see coverlets, but we're getting to educate other people about coverlets and about some of the, the things in their specific families. And that's fun. That's fun. Okay, Ozark Folkways in Winslow. Again, you see the, the blue, and you notice these are called double bow knots or butterflies, whatever you want to call them. Marie said once these are, these all, it's kind of like a Rorschach test. You can see whatever you want to see in the patterns. And I'm just going to tease you about this a little bit. At Ozark Folkways in Winslow, they own six coverlets an old loom, and several other pieces of textile equipment. Unfortunately, they know absolutely nothing about where they came from or even when they came into the building. But here's the little tidbit that we've picked up. The building that Ozark Folkways is now in was started after 1941, but a woman named Clara Muxon went to the site in 1941, fell in love with it, 
and she was a former educator and nun, and she determined that she wanted to help the local people. In 1941, economic times are not so good, roads aren't paved. If you lived back in the hills and you had a job, you might not be able to get there if it's too muddy or snowy or whatever, because the road's not good. So she did, decided to start what was called, what she called, Craft School of the Ozarks. Now, we don't know too much about what training actually went on in the school. We do not believe weaving was actually taught in the school. But she did open a shop as an outlet for people to bring their traditional crafts to sell, to help them provide some income for their family. So there are two other instance, similar instances. One is the Ozark Native Craft Association then moved into this same building. Their goals were the same, and they actually had a state economic development program to also help the local people. And the Ozark Mountain Crafts in Fayetteville was also operated as a through the thrift store. It was called a relief effort. And we have some wonderful pictures of weavers primarily, but also they were doing baskets and chair seats and a few other things like that. And again, their goal was to help the local people improve their income so they could improve their lives. And another thing we know very little about is a WPA program, a weaving center that was set up in Decatur, which is in Benton County. There were several of these around the county, around the country. So now coverlets are not the only things that we looked at, but I'm going to save the next part that is from the University of Arkansas Museum until after Marty tells you some about the patterns. So just talking about myself for a second, I am very ignorant a listener when it comes to jazz or opera. So, you know, I hear a jazz tune, I kind of like it, second and fine. By the fifth one or by the fifth aria, they all sound alike to me because I'm ignorant. I don't know what I'm listening to and I don't understand it. So I realized that Laura and I, we look at a cover and we go, oh my gosh, look at that Tennessee trouble or, ooh, they goofed up that Lee Surrender. Oh, look at that problem. So we see them and, and they speak to us. We know what they are. But if you haven't seen a lot of coverlets, they may all look kind of the same to you. So I thought we would take a really simple walk through how the patterning develops in coverlets and the different ways that people make patterns. So it really starts with stripes. This isn't a coverlet. This is a blanket. But Laura and I love this blanket. It's the Rogers Museum. And we spent many, many time units studying this. And we finally decided a woman had a brown sheet and she spun the wool. And she had a white sheep, and she spun the wool. And then she ran out of wool. So those are stripes. So the simplest thing to make on these kinds of looms are striped fabrics. You can also, though, make checks. And that's pretty much it, because threads go this way, and threads go this way. You can make stripes, and you can make checks. But let's look and see what they do with stripes and checks. This is a pattern, this was at the Prairie Grove Museum, and this actually isn't overshot. This is called Monk's Belt, which is a variation. I think it's an earlier version of overshot, but it looks kind of like a checkerboard, right? So you can make a check kind of pattern. That's very effective, very beautiful. And the checks sort of break down into stripes too, don't they? So it's a checky kind of stripe thing. Here's another one. This is at the Berryville um, Carroll County Historical Museum. Again, you see it very checkerboardy looking, but it's, it's really an effective pattern. Here we go. Now we're getting more into a little bit more interesting pattern. This one is at Ozark Folkways. And you see the checks, don't you? But you also see, see this area here. These are called half tones. So we have pure blue, pure white, and then we have a mixture of blue and white. That's a characteristic of overshot, which is the technique that most weavers use to weave their coverlets. It's these soft little half tones, and because of them, we're going to start developing patterns that look less like checkerboards and that are going to be a little bit more interesting, we think. Here's one. This is at the University of Arkansas Museum, and it's kind of hard uh, to look at from a distance. It breaks down again into to stripes and checks, doesn't it? But if you could see it up close, there's a lot of really cool patterning little snowballs that are going on in here and tables and little stars that almost turn into ovals here. 
So the distance kind of makes a difference too, whether you're seeing it up close or from, you know, seeing it across the whole bed. So it can become a pretty complex image. This one is at the headquarters house at the Washington County Historical Society. And it's, again, checkerboard like. But look what's happening. Can you see right here how this area in the middle is starting to look like ovals? It's starting to form what we call ancillary patterns or secondary patterns. You basically have checks, but because of varying the size of the checks and their position, your eye is seeing some circular things going on or ancillary patterns. So now we're starting developing a more complex looking overshot design. This one is this one blew us away. This is at Cane Hill. Uh, it was just a tour de force. It was just a beautifully woven coverlet. And again, because of the way they're putting together their checks and their stripes, so you're seeing circles here and ovals, which is hard to do in any case, but they're achieving it beautifully with this coverlet. This one's here at the Shiloh Museum. Oh, we love this one. Again, it's red. And all of a sudden, you're not seeing checkerboard so much anymore, are you? Can you see it's we're getting a lot of ovals, a lot of leaf-like kind of images, almost flower-like images in here. This is sort of like a, a dog bone, or what do we call those, Laura? Barbells. Barbells, right. Kind of hard to describe, but the weaver is, is managing her design so that we're seeing much more than just stripes and checks. It's getting even more complex. And I love how the front and the back are beautiful mirror images. This again is another red one. This one's at Rogers. And we're back to our beautiful wig rose pattern where you can see your eye sort of gestalts and fills in the blank and is seeing circles, interlocking circles. When in reality, all that is is just different sizes of rectangles and squares that she's making with her pattern. Because where it's solid red on the top, it's gonna be solid white on the back. So the wool, the colored wool is floating on top and then dipping down and going underneath and then floating on top and then dipping down and going underneath. So that's how that works. Isn't that cool? So it's almost like you've got two different bedspreads. They look quite different with one piece of weaving. So now we're getting even beyond these uh, you know, beautiful circles. Look at this one. This is so slithery, isn't it, with these diagonal? This pattern is actually pretty simple to weave, but people love it or they hate it. I kind of hate it messes with your mind. This one's very uh, popular. It's called cat tracks and snail trails, or some people call it the rattlesnake pattern. It has a lot of different names, but almost every coverlet collection will have one of these because they were very numerous. Lots of them are woven because people just think it's a crazy, crazy fun pattern. But if you look at it very closely, can you see that it's just checks, just different sizes of blocks is fooling your eye into thinking there's snaky lines going on, right? Okay, brace yourself. This is where you strap on your seatbelt. Even if the oxygen drops down, it will not inflate. Here we go. Whoa. So this is one, Laura and I had not seen one like this before anywhere. We've even researched it and haven't even found one. And we've found some that are kind of close, but not just like this in the literature. This is a perfectly flat piece of fabric, but <laughs> because our eyes tell us things that are closer or bigger and things that are smaller or far away, our eyes are sending us information saying this is going up and down, isn't it? But it's not. It's actually very flat, completely flat, in fact. And so the weaver just manipulated the size of those blocks to create this effect. So even though we're limited to stripes and checks, our weavers blew us away all the time with amazing creative things that they did. There's a pattern, it's hard to explain. There's a pattern embedded here that she didn't follow. She, she threaded a pattern that we would, we would have recognized instantly if she'd woven it the way it was supposed to be woven or the way you expected her to weave it, but she didn't. Instead, she wove it a very unique way that created this amazing effect. I think she had to do it deliberately because who would do that? accidentally and not back up and, re, you know, fix it. She liked it. Somebody <laughs> liked it. So these patterns are created on things that are called drafts. That's how weavers record what we do. We call them drafts. And we found some amazing ones here at the Shiloh Museum. We were also delighted to find some at the University of Arkansas Museum. 
And this notation right here weaves this cloth. Laura has woven it in this beautiful sample, which is so cool to know that here's something, a communication from the 1800s. You know, over 100 years later, we were able to weave that pattern. And hopefully 100 years from now, some weaver will be able to weave it again. We were thrilled to pieces to find these, and we translated them to figure out what they would look like. This one was one of my favorites. I, you probably can't see it, but right here it says nine snowballs, nine snowballs, twice. But does anybody notice anything kind of strange? These are the snowballs. There's 16 snowballs. So I'm not sure what happened there, but there's 16 snowballs, and the draft is called nine snowballs. Note here that, see how this one, the one before it, see how this numbers? This one has little marks. This is very common because our weavers couldn't always read and write, but anyone can weave this. So not only could the weaver read it, but anyone could read it, whether they could read or write or not. So on these looms, they have four shafts, four of these bars with heddles hanging down. Okay, these lines represent the four shafts, four, three, two, one. So this would say, put this many threads alternating on the third, the fourth, the third, the fourth, the third, the fourth. This one, now you're alternating the second, the third, the second, the third. You see what I'm saying? So these little marks represent single threads. So you think about it, single threads. <laughs> um, and tell us where, which, which shaft to put these little single threads on. And then you repeat it a bunch of times, because this is just one time, and then you would repeat it many times to make your whole coverlet. There's two different ways. You ask about, is it common to weave it two different ways? Two different ways. This one looks more like stars. This one looks a little bit more like roses or round, so that it forms that snowball effect. So uh, we love this one a lot. We haven't woven it yet, because it's going to be really big, but we're planning to. Now it's Laura's turn again. Well, we go back and forth on this. The, these paper drafts are really very interesting. Very often it's multiple pieces of paper that are connected together, often sewn with a thread to overlap the pieces of paper. Remember that paper and ink and all of that was at a premium. So one of the delightful things we have discovered on the backs of some of the drafts are some, some things you didn't expect. And to be honest, the first time we looked at these drafts at the university, we didn't turn them over. <laughs> and I'm not quite sure how we, one of us said, what if there was anything on the back of it? Well, on the one you just saw, this is on the back. And you see, it's a delightful little drawing. I believe that the drawing came first, and then it was cut apart to use as a weaving draft. And we don't have too many clues about this one. That's a whole nother story about who did these. But you notice they're also practicing their ABCs. A, B, C, D. This is Sarah B. Williford. Okay, so here is the whole draft. Now, with a name like Sarah B. Williford on the draft, wouldn't you think I could figure out who that is, where she lived, and when? Do you know how many Sarah Willifords there are in Northwest Arkansas? numerous. And so we're not exactly sure who Sarah is. We have some clues, but we're not exactly sure. And this is the back of that one. And it is a store ledger, apparently. And there are, here's five pounds of sugar, 50 cents, four pounds of coffee, 50 cents, some other things, a day of work at Harness. So they're bartering a day of work for some of the items that they're purchasing. And now here's another one. And again, you can see how it could be woven two different ways. So here you see a very long draft and you can tell that this is one piece of paper and this and this. And on the back is a real treasure. Oh, by the way, this up, up here at the very tip top, you can't see that, but it says gallon of whiskey. <laughs> so we call it the gallon of whiskey. So of course we call it the gallon of whiskey yeah. draft, right? It's, it's a store ledger. 
And this is, that was part of the store ledger. And um, these folks drank a lot based on this store ledger. It, I'm sure it was all for medicinal purposes. But over here is what we want to finish up with today. This is two, two parts of a letter that have been cut apart and used for this draft. And there's a letter from the magic of computers allowed me to put it together. Again, I don't know exactly when it was written or by whom. Even though there's a name on there, G.W. Williford, do you know how many George Washington Williford's there are? Lots, to my surprise. I expected to be able to figure this out, and we may yet. But I want to read you just a little part of this letter because I think it's very poignant. So if it's mid 1800s somewhere in there, put your mind in there. And he writes, uh, there's a first page that we apparently don't have. And this is, appears to be a second page. And he writes, time has passed and another stage of our existence has come. The business of the world calls our attention. Now we can reflect upon the past and it all seems as a vision, a madness of dreams. Think what this young man's been through, maybe. I feel as though my life was half spent, yet I am only about 20 years old. I am not very large. I suppose it is a family failing for us to be small. I weigh only 138 pounds. Tell Emily and Marianne to write without delay, and tell Uncle Claiborne's folks to write too, and I will answer them. And then he goes on a little bit and signs it, your affectionate grandson, G.W. Williford. So when I think about this, I think, is this post-Civil War? Is it, post, is it Mexican War? What other reverses has the young man been through to write this very, I think, heartfelt letter to his grandmother? And I wish I knew who he was and who his grandmother was. And so we've seen that these coverlets are all a product of their time, the people, and the place where they were created. And we can appreciate them both as art, because they're beautiful as weavers and the execution of the project. And as I said at the very beginning, as the backdrop to history, because we can learn a lot about the very local and personal history by learning about these people and the weavers. And so we go forward. We're moving into the second uh, phase of, of our project. Um, we're in the self-editing stage. And I have to tell you that once you do all the research, there's a whole lot that has to happen after that. And that was a surprise to me. I'd never been through that. But we're going forward, and maybe by next year, we'll have the second book that will talk about all the coverlets that you've seen today and more. So we thank you very much. Thanks for coming.